to the Native Informant podcast. Just introduce yourself. Tell everybody who you are. As you mentioned, my name is Ahmed Abid al-Mansouri. I'm a form, former member of the Federal National Council. My passion is history, so I established uh, since 2012 three museums. Uh, the Crossroads Civilization Museum, the Old Weapons Museum, and Old Manuscripts, Old Prints, and Old Books Museum. The reason why I wanted to interview you, and we've had multiple conversations about this, is the fact that I would say, without a doubt, your collection was just absolutely beautiful, so I had to interview you. And so we wanted to start off with this piece, which is right next to us. I think people need to understand, for those who are listening as well as watching, that Mr. El Mansouri decided to bring the works to the studio so that we were able to see them in real life. And I don't think people realize how insane that is to be able to move things from outside a museum and put it back in. And he's like, we'll do it Arab style. Yalla, everyone just goes in and goes out. It's not a problem. <laughs> We're very efficient. <laughs> We're used to it. We're efficient. We're very, very efficient in an effective way. Uh, this piece, it was a gift from Sayyid Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid bin Mani'a bin Rashid. Uh, it was, the, it's the plate about how to, how to make maps, the location of the pearls from the Gulf, from Ras al-Khaimah until Salah, the whole area. And uh, when we established the Pearl Gallery last year, in January 2022, he came visit us. And when he, when he saw that one, he said, you know, uh, usually the pearls are seen by either by the traders or by the divers, the pearl divers. So he said, you deserve this one. So he gave me this uh, royal gift and uh, we are so honored to have it. That map was made by his grandfather and he dedicated that for me, this uh, map. He gave it to us as a gift for the museum. Because his grandfather was caring about the, the divers. So he made sure that, you know, uh, the, he put them on the map so they go there, they don't get lost. Because many of them, they lose their life. It's very risky, very risky thing. You know, the, those treasure hunters, you know, in the ocean, it's very, very risky. So that's why he made this map. So it will be a guide for the people. This is before, I'm talking from 1939. So before navigation, before all of the technology that people have right now. You know, uh, you know, Pearl was something very important for all of us. It was like our oil in that part time. And it was one of the source of income for the whole city and the whole village moves. It's a real industry. And uh, so we are very honored to have this plate for it. And uh, he also gave us the right to, if we want to print more, but we are not, we, we put it as a museum because it's a historical piece so people can see it. You know, this is uh, you know, very, very touchy, very close to our heart. When we talk about Arab art, especially within the region, some of the pieces that you're going to show us, it really is a complete switch of how we were actually represented. We were viewed as people of enlightenment. Why did you feel it was important to have a museum or to start a museum? Uh, my passion for the history was from childhood, from my grandparents' house. I haven't heard a lot from them, most important documents from the, about the region, especially about our region, our Emirates, mainly Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and then Sharjah, and then lesser from other Emirates. But uh, So it was very impressive. I saw the level of uh, literacy. It was very high. So my passion was there. So phase one was from my childhood, the passion. Secondly is the search. Because all what you know, you know, uh, I think there are not many efforts have been done about our history, the history of the Gulf, of the Arabian Gulf. But we know that we have history, but unfortunately, you know, most of our history is not written. It's oral history. As part of me being a researcher, when someone gives me an information, I like to go back to the roots. So if you give me information, I will try to find a manuscript or the first edition. And uh, even maps about the Gulf and all these things. So it was very important for me to, uh, you know, to search. I know that, you know, from our literature, from our traditions, that this area was, has not always been desert. You know, there was some climate change happened. After the discovery, you know, after the oil, we had the opportunity to build our infrastructure. When you do physical infrastructure, that, does, that means that you have to dig. So many people ask question, how come right now you discover this history? Why not discover them before? Well, before nobody was digging. Our houses were from tents, which are from the wools of the sheep, or from palm tree leaves. Now, the higher you want to go in the history, the higher you want to go in the modernity and uh, sky rising, you have to dig, uh, dig deeper. Every time they dig, they find something. We have places where for minting coins. We have Greek coins here. We have different Islamic dynasties coins here, especially from Abbasides sites and other ones. We have also uh, Alexander the Great coins minted here. Name it any Emirates. You know, it's not just the, our Emirates. Even if you go to Oman, to other areas in different countries of the Gulf, everywhere you have places and lots of discoveries. One of the latest discoveries, you know, we have, for example, in Dubai, it's about the Saruq al-Hadid, this area, which was is in the middle of desert. Who will make manufacturing in the middle of the desert? At that time, it was not desert. And we, from the fossils of the trees, you can have, from there, there's an area between Dubai and Al-Ain area. Like, from that place, in a chain of fossil of trees until Dubai Creek, it was fresh water there. That was a canal there. Uh, you know, for movement, for logistics. Dubai Creek was not salty. The Gulf was not salty. 
you know, something happened like in you know, 1000 BC, something, then the climate change happened in the region, and that, uh, unfortunately, many people, when you talk to them about the history, they only talk about the heritage. They don't think beyond 100 years, you know, because that's what we taught in the books, which were imported from outside. For example, uh, the first record of the Gulf, a Western record, between six, uh, 700 and 600 BC by the Greek, because the Gulf was very important as a trade place. People talk about the Silk Road, which is the mountainous, more dangerous, but the sea was also one of the path for it. The Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, much was much more important even at a certain time than uh, the Red Sea. So this area and our ancestors were not foreign for being, you know, uh, having a role in the history, a positive role in the history. Absolutely. And I think it's so important to touch base on the fact that it was a highly elevated and sophisticated society. And so your museum, I feel, does exactly that in, on so many levels because the artwork really speaks to the people, of the people, by the people within the region. Tell me about the work that you have in your hand. Uh, in my hand, I have it's. Uh, the royal copy of a book of a traveler called Gasparo Balbi. He's an Italian. He's originally from Genoa, but the, his, his trip was from Venice, and he also reached to Japan. He was a jeweler looking only for pearls. He's the one who did the, and things in writing. He, there's no maps in this book. So his trip was from uh, 1577, sorry, 1579, uh, up to about the 16th century, until 1588, like almost 10 years. Then he's traveling, looking for, just documenting where he can find pearls. And of course, he passed by many countries like Iraq and uh, Basra there and Bahrain. And also there is a section here in page 49. And, and even in the other copies, which they made for the other, uh, for the people, even when the, the Dutch copy, which was made also 1700, they did not change the page numbers, all the same. So when I, well, that's why I mentioned the page number. So here he talks about, you know, places that uh, have pearls. He talks about, for example, Sir Ben Yas, uh, Dubai, Ras Al Khaimah, Ajman, Graya, talks about Diba, and talks about uh, different places in the region. It's very, this is considered the first documented book about our names. So many people, if you ask them, you know, when the name, our names were established, they don't know. They think it's recent names. And uh, what year did you say it was? Uh, this was printed in 1590. Wow. Late 16th century. 16th century. Uh, but the trip was, you know, 10 years before that. Pearls were like our natural resource at that time. And uh, we were one of the hubs for the pearls. Even I have later, you know, there's a book by Pliny, the first encyclopedia in the world. Even mentioned the most beautiful pearls in the world are from the Arabian side of the Gulf. So because we are very well known for the pearls. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and pearls brought the traders, brought many countries, many like, you know, powers that were interested in the region because of the pearls, one of, one of the reasons for that. The rich heritage and the history, yeah. the fact that they had mentioned the, the region and the places from 16th century goes yeah. to show how vibrant yeah. and colorful this place was. Uh, one thing interesting, like when he mentions uh, uh, Dubai, he says Dubai, like us, Dubai, he wrote Dubai, like how we pronounce it. You know, it doesn't say Dubai. So it's, uh, that's very interesting. <laughs> Note to everyone, it is Dubai, yeah. not Dubai. <laughs> Outside of this podcast, when we had had conversations, we had addressed the fact that we are such hospitable people, that we lead with generosity and hospitality. Mm. And so are there any manuscripts that you have that document this, this understanding of us? Everybody knows that Europeans were in the region for centuries. And we have we have very beautiful you know interaction, some good, some bad, but you know very well recorded interaction between Europe and the Middle East. And in the museum, we own the, the rarest manuscript and rarest books from the 16th to 19th century. Here, which is very rare to have to find the first record of interaction between the people from the United States of America, from the United States, with uh, the Gulf people. This book is from uh, 1794, uh, 18th century, yeah, 18th wow. century. Called, uh, it's by Daniel Saunders, you know, it calls travels and sufferings. They did not suffer because of us, uh, that we, people come with the ships, they want to go somewhere else, then, you know, something happened, their ship wrecks, and then they end up with us. And, the, uh, and our, like, ancestors, people, they, uh, they take care of them, they are hospital, they make sure that, you know, they're okay, they go. So in this book, the, uh, that's the, the first record, which is very positive, documents that thing also. There was a movement in Europe. After the Renaissance, there was a movement to understand others. So there was a question. So because you know there were lots of stereotypical perspectives, were uh, preperceptions, were uh, not right. Uh, reintroduced them uh, by reading from their philosophies, their books. For example, uh, they took a book uh, of Baha al-Din, took his journal, his diary. He was the companion of Salah al-Din, and they translated to the Latin. And the first edition we have in the museums from 1732. That's why he's very well respected Salah al-Din in Europe. 
uh, they, t- they, m- they took book of Georges about Islam and they translated to Latin. And Hottinger, in this book, he put about different religions, about Judaism, about Islam, about the Arabs, about the Jews. Uh, for the first time, you know, uh, there was an attempt to uh, understand different uh, religions, different people, ethnicities from themselves not only by taking historic or stereotypical things. So this part of history, people don't take care about it. Because, um, and uh, for me, at the Crossroads Civilization Museum, when do I feel like, you know, yes, you know, I'm very content, very happy. When I see children from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different religions, they come to the museum under one roof. They see themselves, that boosts their you know, confidence, their self-image, their self-esteem, and, you know, and everything. At the same time, they see also things from other cultures, other people. So they say, we are important, others are also important. The government came to me when the museum was in my house from 2006, 2011. They said, you are talking about the culture of the country, the culture of the city, come out. We're gonna give you the best house available and they gave me the Royal House. So in 2012, we established a Crossroads Civilization Museum, which was a private collection, private museum, only by invitation. It became still private collection, but a public museum. Uh, this museum, it's, it's how an Emirati, simple Emirati, sees the world, what's important in the world, and see the world. And I think uh, it added value. So that's why international is very, very recognized for, uh, it became one of the centers of peace and of tolerance and of openness and embracing everyone. It's interesting that you should say that because whenever I have conversations about museums, the first question I have to ask is civic empathy and whether it exists through the narrative of the museum. From the our people, especially the religious people who come to the museum, uh, I'm talking about real religious people come here, they get very excited. They have seen this before, they've heard them, but they've never seen them. So, uh, and they, you know, it's, uh, it's like a sort of opening. What I discovered, people when they come to the museum, they keep their judgmental, their whatever political hat, judgmental stand they have outside, they wear the hat of the, of the journey and the history. So what example do you have of that where people got really excited? Uh, for example, uh, people heard about uh, the founder of the Protestant uh, religion and Christianity, uh, Martin Luther. In 1515, he had that movement. So I have his prayer book, which he was reading it in his own church from his time, from 1523. You know, this is one of the powerful examples we have there. And we have different examples. You know, uh, we have a prayer bowl, uh, which has uh, three Semitic languages in it, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Arabic. This is uh, from two hours, 10 minutes from here, the, the region. And, uh, and that it's exactly the same prayers we have. We say it in, uh, as Muslims, as Arabs. Uh, we have like uh, the King James Bible, and we have uh, the facsimile of the Gutenberg Bible, the complete one, which is very rare. We have number 14 out of 300, which they made. And what possessed you to collect such a collectible item? These are part of our uh, history, part of our culture, part of our roots of our religion. We believe in all the prophets, regardless of differences and, and a few things, but it is the same God, the same prophet. So nothing, you know, even in the Quran always says, go look back on the other books. It's a divine invitation. And uh, also we see many prophecies there about us in these books, you know, you know, especially King James Bible, it's which is the closest to the oldest one. So, so many things. And, you know, it is, uh, it's one religion and, all, and we respect all holy books. Didn't you say in the King James Bible it mentions Becca? Becca, about Mecca. About and then Mecca. I bought the dictionary of King James Bible, uh, the old dictionary. It says Becca, it says Mecca, Mecca. Also about the migration and also coming back to Mecca with 10,000 uh, saints, the prophet. It's in, in details, it's written there. Well, it's just uh, a yeah. perfect example of how we were all interwoven yeah. and how much we contributed to each other's progression. Exactly. One of my favorite pieces that you had in the collection was this beautiful coin and I felt that as soon as I looked at it, it was, for all intents and purposes, a representation of Arab identity. That coin um, was from the time of King Trajan, uh, who was the, who ruled from the late first century uh, until the beginning, of the first half of the second century. And that coin was minted around 117 AD. And uh, during the Roman Empire, because they were very powerful, they expanded everywhere, and he he used to have King Trajan like trades with different regions. For example, you know, if he was had if he had trade with Egypt, so he wants to know the money coming from there. So they minted coins, especially coming from Egypt, with a you know a man laying down reflecting the Nile. What was the fantasy or the perception? You know about Arabia. Arabia is always a mystery. It's about fantasy. You know, so their perception was about our region because we, you know, we, as I told you, we're not talking about the Silk Road. We're talking about the you know the water. So uh, the perception was you know about the princess. So they minted the coin on one side, his face. The second side, a princess from Arabia uh, next to a baby camel 
and on the other hand she's holding cinnamon sticks yeah, as, as a route of the of the perfume route of the spice uh, of or of the incense we were one of the very important uh, routes for them you know in terms of trade and uh, as a port you know logistically the dubai creek was a trade there was one of the trade hubs since 3000 bc which is 5000 years old so these are all triggers for me to be you know to indulge more indulge more get more into history and to the identity about our role and that you know it's one of my mission to to really highlight our roles in, the, uh, in that area so you know this region will always be important we became very very resilient you know and uh, and there are many examples can talk about it so we know how to deal with different people and uh, so diplomacy wisdom resilience as part of our uh, culture we did not change we are still very proud of our national identity so we keep our values we are very firm with we with keep with our identity but at the same time you know we are very open to learn and to cope with modernity and move forward speaking of documentation and archival history what is the next manuscript that you have it's the first complete English printing of first encyclopedia in the world which was made by pliny pliny the elder Plinius, that's his name. Some people say he's Roman. Some people say he's originally Greek. There's two two Plinies, right? Uh, oh yeah, the first one uh, who was born in the 23rd AD until 79 AD. Then his nephew continued. His name was also Pliny, mm-hmm. and also he talked about our region. He said he talks about the Persian and the Arabian Gulf. Even he pronounces the names at that time of the uh, areas in the, from southern uh, Persia, as uh, as we pronounce them in Arabic. One area they call it Linga in Persian. He said linear, the way we pronounce it. Uh, also, he talks about the Arabs. He said you cannot talk about the Arabs as tale of civilizations, you, in a very respectable way. You know, the most beautiful pearls in the world are from the Arabian side of the Gulf. Out of all of the manuscript that you've just showed us, we have one final one. I did not bring everything with me. I cannot leave the museum empty, so I would like people to come visit there. But uh, I just brought some certain highlights that you know reflects our uh, interaction here. We have the called the Book of Arian, and uh, you know this book uh, was written in the second century about Alexander the Great. It's about Alexander the Great from 30, 336 to 325. When Alexander the Great defeated the Achmenian dynasty in Persia, and then he went to India. Some people say he did not go to India, but but in this book says he went to India. The Arabs of the north, north countries, they recognize him as a power. They send them gifts and ambassador that. And six about the sheikhdoms of the Gulf, they said, you know, you as a Greek, you replaced the Persians. We recognize you as a government, and that's it. Because we knew how to deal with different powers. We are used to these things. He was very upset. I'm talking about 324 BC. He was very angry. And he sent Narcos, his, the commander uh, of uh, his military, to survey the area. And he thought that we were like barbaric and, you know, we are no. He did the survey from an area from Ras al-Khaimah to Traden. Traden was an old name of Kuwait. Like after a year, he came to Alexander the Great with his report. Also, they came, uh, there's a report, uh, another one about us. So they presented those two reports to Alexander the Great. He was so impressed. He said, you are not talking about people who are uncivilized. You are talking about people who are, uh, you are describing Phoenician civilizations. Because Alexander the Great has always been, you know, very impressed with the Phoenician civilization. So he looked at us very, very highly. There's another source says that he wanted to move his dynasty to our side. But, you know, sadly, he died later. You know, and uh, so what happened is that uh, these are elements that reflect about the level of our uh, civilization, if you want to say. It's one of the criteria to go back. And what I personally believe from my readings, from what I see, many civilizations, they were in our region and they moved from our, uh, to other places. It's not vice versa. Because we have many archaeological areas. If you go from Ras al-Khaimah to any place, any Emerson in the UAE, so of, 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 uh, of different civilizations. You know, we have a place called uh, Gasol Zebba. This area, this palace, uh, of Danubia. You know, she was the queen of uh, Palamera, Tedmur. So she was to, the weather was nice, Ras Khaimah, in the, in the winter. She used to come here. And she's from Beni Kalb, also Kalbiun, uh, the old tribe. And the weather was much nice uh, in the summer in the Palamera. So she was coming back and forth. So there is a link. And I think many, many civilizations, they were in our area, then they went to the north because of the climate change happened in the region. What's interesting also to know with all of the manuscripts that you showed that they challenged the narrative by revisiting the misconceptions about this region. And these books are proof that even yeah. today, when we challenge those misconceptions, they regurgitate that same narrative. It's so lovely to know that as effective as it was then, 
it is just as effective as it is now. The history, the narrative, uh, the narration of our history uh, is not complete. I'm talking about historical, deep history. You know, history is like, you know, it's a mosaic, like a mosaic painting you have. Every manuscript, every uh, book, every information, every old print map adds to the history, to, the, to that. So one reason, the, the excavations in our region was, uh, was uh, comp- uh, is very late comparing to other regions because most of the monarchies in Europe were interested in biblical Arabia and we are not part of biblical Arabia. So that's why there they were no uh, expeditions, you know, missions for uh, excavation there. And secondly, as I told you, the, because of the climate change, so, you know, uh, nobody was digging. So things are again being discovered right now. We are presenting facts. We want to show the people what we have, what we see. And, uh, you know, and it's the time, you know, to, uh, to rewrite the history, to include these facts. I'm not an expert. You know, I have passion for history. You know, and uh, and the museum is one of the source of knowledge. And when I find something interesting, and reflects, you know, something, you know, a, a certain facts which uh, people are neglecting it, or it's, uh, the, or they have not reached it, uh, the museum shows that, you know, it, it's a platform people can come research. That's why we have most of the researchers come from outside the country. That we, as a museum, uh, can represent everything. Here, museum is not about political correct. It's about showing facts, and some books saying bad things about us, some folks have good things about us. But these are part of history. We, we do not, you know, get intimidated by someone underestimates us. Because, you know, if people who underestimate us, you know, if they were smart enough, they would not underestimate us. So here we don't get intimidated with these things. Here, we, you know, we are trying to, it's a, it's a history. And I think I don't, although I own the collection, but I am only a, a keeper for the next, who's going to continue preserving such history. You keep the values that keep you resilient, strong, and progressive. Thank you so much for being here. It was an honor and a privilege to not only witness these historical artifacts that you have, but to invite us into just a small looking glass into the museum. What would you like to tell people about the museum? Where can they find it? Where can they come visit? The museum is open uh, from 8 to 8, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day. And uh, it's an historical Shindar area. And we have three museums, the Crossroads of Civilization Museum and the other two museums just right behind it, the old manuscripts, old prints and old books museum, also the Museum of the Old Weapons, Historical Weapons. If they want to understand the UAE, I think this museum really reflects uh, who we are, how do we see the world, what's important. This museum, there was no intervention by any uh, foreign creator there. It was made by Marathi and, you know, uh, how we see the world. So, and that by itself uh, is an adding value. Uh, I encourage everyone to go and see this museum and the collection is absolutely fantastic. Uh, If you're watching, please like, subscribe, hit the notification of bell and see us next time for the next guest. So I'm Sarah Alagrubi, this is The Native Informant and goodbye.